Welcome to the Midlife Pilot Podcast. We are glad you're with us. What is it like to become a pilot in your 40s and 50s? The challenges are unique for those of us in midlife, but so are the rewards. Hosts Ben, Brian, and Ted talk learning to fly, growing as pilots, and the joy of flying to destinations. The purpose of the podcast is not to teach, but to share knowledge and experiences of being a midlife pilot. Join the Midlife Pilot community and listen in every week. We are not CFIs or particularly intelligent, so if you want to learn how to fly, talk to to anyone else other than the hosts of a podcast. Even this intro was too challenging for us and we used a robot to do it. Okay, checklists are complete. Let's get the show started. Hello and welcome to episode 85 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast, where we talk all things flying and aviation in midlife. My name's Ben. I am a certificated commercial pilot, commercial certificated pilot. I forget how you say it. I fly here in the Atlanta metropolitan area uh, in a Cessna 182 we like to call the Beast. Tonight, as usual, we have my friend Brian, a private pilot located in Nashville, which if you don't know, is the home of the Bachelorette Super Charlie. He flies a Cherokee 180 named Lucy. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you guys? We are good, thank you. Yeah, All good. Also joining us tonight, we have our friend Ted. He is a sport pilot located in Portlandia. He flies a flight design CTLS, also affectionately known as the Egg. Hello, sir. Hey, how are you? I'm good. You know, I love seeing our chat here, you know, hearing from all of our our, uh, OSH friends. Yes. uh, Juliet Victor and AJ uh, are all out there. A lot of people out there. Get some emails too, so uh, it should be fun. Uh, I look forward uh, to our friend One Doll Geek is gonna make his way down here to Atlanta and fly with me in the Beast. Uh, he won't actually be attending Osh, but attending uh, long uh, family hadn't seen in a really long time, which is appropriate in my opinion. Is he gonna we'll ride with up there? Huh? Is he gonna just ride in the back? You know, I'm gonna leave that up to him. Uh, I actually land better when I do have somebody in the back seat. <laughs> so maybe for his sake, it might be best that I just ban him to the back. I don't think he'd have any objections though. One, one dull ballast. <laughs> <laughs> um, just mark that on the tape that Brian said that, not me. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm excited. Uh, looks like we might have a little fun with the uh, weather early in the morning on Friday, but once we get north of uh, Tennessee, should be pretty much clear sky the whole way. What have you guys been up to, Brian? Been flying at all? Well, you know, airplanes sometimes have to be maintained, I suppose. Seems like a good idea. So we're doing some of that. We are, uh, we sent our mags off. And I, if if for any, you know, pilots listening that haven't seen the inner workings of a magneto in person, you should definitely do it because it will terrify you (laughs) when it looks like, uh, I don't know. It looks like the componentry of a clock radio you had in 1977 or something, you know, it just, it, the, the plastic and the gears and the, it, it just, it's clear, um, that we are operating on tractor technology from the early 20th century. And while, You know, modernity has maybe served the Magneto construction by a little bit of plastic, a little bit, you know, whatever it is. It's kind of terrifying. But anyway, we were up against our 500 hours. And so we pulled both mags and shipped them off so that we could have them gone through. And um, so, you know, that invites, and the airport was closed for a week anyway. So we just decided this is a good time to try to do that. And... I think also, um, I don't know, you, 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 you don't want to be down this time of year, but it's been so miserably hot that it kind of hasn't been, a, you know, not missing a whole lot. It's only just now starting to come off of this crazy heat wave that we've been on. So it hasn't been too disappointing necessarily to not be able to fly for once, you know, where every day isn't just a criminally painful day of not flying, you know, it's like, ah, you know, all right, this stuff's happening. And um, so, so it gets so rid of the comments. Number one, I've noticed that you've got a strained relationship with magnetos over your aviation journey. <laughs> oh, you know, 
Let's not talk about that. Yes. Number two, I think you bring up an excellent point in that I may talk, I, it's probably too late to do it now, but I would love to push our annual for the middle of July because you're right. Um, it is just so unbelievable. Even if you're on the ground from the time you start your airplane up till 15 minutes and you're at 5,000 feet, it is miserable. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's just, yeah, it just, it's barely tolerable. Well, one thing about that is if you've got it scheduled for now, you don't have guilt about not flying, even though it's hot, right? It's like, yeah. oh, darn, I can't, I can't fly in this 110 degree heat. Yeah. And also just when it's, you know, you're going to be down for a couple of three weeks, it gives you a chance also to do a lot of things that you normally don't want to do uh, in terms of, you know, hangar type of tasks and some other things with the plane for sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of, we have, there's a laundry list of things that we're going to be doing. I think that we're going to go up tomorrow. And so if anybody wants to meet up at the Bowling Green airport and help us out with God knows whatever we're doing, you know, come, come along. But uh but yeah, so it's kind of a, you know, a, a sort of step back kind of maintenance time. One of the things I was uh, talking about with uh, the partner in my plane is that it's interesting how I feel like I've gotten to a number of hours now to where I don't feel any kind of nervousness necessarily about not flying for a period of time where it used to be that if I didn't fly for a couple of weeks, I felt like there's going to be this <laughs> reassimilation period. And now I don't, I feel like I've reached a threshold maybe later than most people, but I still feel like I've reached that point to where I'm just not even remotely uh, concerned about that. And I'm going to possibly twist that into a hazardous attitude, which is <laughs> uh, one of our, uh, which is the topic for, for tonight. But, um, but actually before we even get into that, I also want to mention that we were talking about flying when it's hot. That's actually one of the topics that I kind of uh, proposed or had thought of proposing was because I think. I, I have had some experiences where I realized you, you need to know when to say when, or there are planning considerations around flying when it's that hot. And it's not just fly early and fly late. It's, it's a whole lot of things. Um, and so I thought maybe it'd be a good summertime uh, topic to look at it from the midlife point of view. But for now we're doing hazardous attitude. So yeah, Lucy's in maintenance, all good. We just uh, renewed our insurance. So that's always fun. Uh, so, you know, we're just spending money and not flying. <laughs> Speaking of not spending money and flying, the exact opposite of that, Ted, you've been going up a little bit. I think I've seen on the creeper bot. I've gotten up a little bit. Um, not a lot of big stuff. And, uh, but uh, we have a, uh, we have a member who secretly has been able to help me with some, uh, um, uh, some of the, the math behind, uh, Pine flying and uh, uh, there's a word for that. I can't think of it. Anyway, um, I, so I've really been spending some time trying to test out my glide ratios and uh, figure out if uh, uh, if if I glide better at minus six, which is a reflex flap setting, or at zero. And it took me several flights to figure out how to actually test that. Uh, and so I finally figured it out. And the answer is minus six has a better glide ratio. But it took a lot of testing to figure that out. And uh, climbing to 10,000 feet and then gliding down uh, takes 30 to 40 minutes per time. So, you know, do that three times, that's a two hour flight. Just just sitting there, pretty boring. Just, you know, I, I know you say you don't get bored, Brian, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> one of the- you're staring at your airspeed indicator. Yeah. Pitching well, for that best guy. Better yet, uh, put on autopilot. So it does a lot better job of keeping at the airspeed than I do. Um, so yeah, one of the times I just uh, stayed on tower, even though it was 25 miles away and just listened to them the whole time. And like when I came back like an hour and a half later, they said, oh, welcome back. And so like, oh, you don't know, I was here the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's been nice to get up a little bit. How the, the, the heat up there, I mean, or is it, I know Portland, I've been to Portland in July and thought I did a round trip in the airplane right back to Atlanta. It yeah. was very similar. Yes. Is it, how is it right now? Is it pretty moderate or? It's really moderate right now. This is uh, at the stage where we have no weather. Uh, it's about 80. So, and yeah, no humidity. Nice. So who cares, you know? Promised uh, land weather. 
we were peaking over a hundred for a little while and, and that didn't last long enough, but you know, or le- didn't last too long. I mean, and so, yeah, it's been a decent summer for, for that. Cool. Let's uh, cover a few of the housekeeping topics. Yeah. There's really only one topic and that's housekeeping. We broadcast on YouTube, usually every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. The live chat is open for questions and comments. We've got 19 folks in there. We've got a few, look like one or two new ones and some old friends in there as well. It's great to see. Um, It is primarily an audio podcast. So please, please subscribe using your favorite app, follow or like or whatever button they give you to push. You can find our podcast links, contact info, and become a Patreon supporter, even more importantly, the links are at our website. Uh, at Midlife, or no, the website is midlifepilotpodcast.com. <laughs> um, when you do subscribe or follow, or even if you've done it in the past, we're still looking for some reviews to read. Um, you know, it does take a little effort to, um, you know, stop what you're doing and, put something down on there. Uh, we would really appreciate a, a five-star review. Uh, and again, I'm not above bribing. I'll, I'll send you a sticker or two. Um, anything nice that you can say, it might be you know, hard to do that sometimes, but uh, we would really appreciate any uh, reviews that you could uh, leave us. Ben, it's it, um, whenever I get a haircut, they say, what do you want? And I say, I want you to pretend like I am someone that you care about deeply family member spouse something somebody you really care about and cut my hair that's what i want (laughs) and the reason why i bring that up is that's kind of how i feel about all this it's like we need reviews we need five star reviews uh we had a good stream of them coming in for a while but they've kind of slowed down and that is really what helps us more than anything uh with the old, old mr algorithm and we just love seeing it so please um just seconding that uh if you have the time, please do it because, uh, you know, it helps us bring more people to the party. Speaking of parties, we, um, we've we got a few new Patreon members. And uh, Ted, do you want to let everybody know who's joined? Yeah. So at the Landomatic level, we have Brandon T. At the Hershey Bar level, we have Braden D. Uh, Brandon and Braden, I like that. And at the Beast Stole Kit level, we have James S. So thank you very much for joining. And, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about before the show on part of the value of the Midlife Podcast has been the Discord community. And there's a lot more that goes on there uh, outside of the podcast. And uh, some real gems of, of moments that can happen on there. Um, and so it's been nice to see people uh, enjoying that and enjoying life without us even. <laughs> you didn't expect that. <laughs> this is, oh gosh. Oh, by the way, Todd is asking in the chat, uh, cause he says he wasn't paying attention during the housekeeping, which I totally understand. Uh, where do we do the five-star review? Go to iTunes or, app, or I'm sorry, Apple podcasts. And that's really the place. But generally every podcast app will allow you to leave a review but Apple Podcasts is probably the best place. Second would be yeah. maybe Spotify. Um, or just, you know, yell it out your front door and see how that goes. But You uh, could yeah. send us an email mm-hmm. at midlifepilotpodcast at gmail.com and give us a review. We'll read it there. Um, we're not very picky, but it would be most helpful if you did it in the podcast player that does help with those algorithms. Yeah. But, um, well, the other yeah. Thing about- it, go ahead. Go ahead. You I was going to say the the value, you know, you and Chris originated this and, and this community has been, you know, has been was mighty and small, as you used to say, and it's grown and it's grown. And, you know, I was always fearful that if it grew too much, that it would lose a lot of that connectedness. And I would say it's probably more connected now than it has ever been. Um, I it is a form of the social meds that I, media that I, I review um, because just everybody on there is great. They're, you, we don't have to police anything. Everybody is just really, it's, it's just put, has their input, has a lot of funny things to say. It's, it's just awesome. I think it's the best online community in aviation and I am biased, but I think that any other communities that I've been a part of or am a part of 
or, you know, gosh, if you go to Facebook, you know, it's a dumpster fire. Right. Uh, right. You know, it's just, it really is uh, pretty amazing. And we, we, it's not like we're, yeah, it's, it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, users, members, wherever you want to call it, are making their own content. There's debriefs, there's live video chats, there's all kinds of really interesting things happening uh, all the time. And so it, it just makes me really, really happy. And, uh, you know, anyway, so I'd shout out to everybody uh, in the, from the Discord. Really, it's, it's, it's kind of magical. We haven't really spent a lot of time talking about that, but it is massively important. And a great way to, uh, it's sort of the Atkins diet of social media. You, you're, like you're saying, Ben, you know, you, you, uh, if you, if you start, uh, if you put discord on your phone and then th those are the, it, I gravitate there. Those are the conversations that I, I want to hear. And there are no conversations going on that I don't want to hear. And we don't have to talk about what those are related to, <laughs> especially lately. So it's been yeah. amazing. It's, it's, it's a respite. It's a beautiful place. It really I is. really thank and, everyone. And we mentioned the creeper bot earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, so for those of you listening that aren't on our Discord server, uh, our amazing admin team of Ted and One Dog Geek, um, they have these automated systems where when you go at your discretion, you can choose to enroll in this or not. We're not, you know, it, fully voluntary, but you can give us your tail number. And then whenever you go fly and um, it, it picks it up. And so we can all creep on you and see where you're flying. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it, it's a really fun way to see, you know, who's been up in the air and and uh, think about about that person if you haven't heard from them much lately. And it's like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, well, and all the links are there. Multiple ADSB links for each flight. You can you even see what people are squawking. Uh, so it's really cool because a lot of times you can just see, oh well, you know, Ted's flying, and then if you want to pop on live ATC because you know where he, you know, what center he's probably on with or whatever. You know, it's just. It's a way to sort of, in a weird way too, I think it's actually nice because you, obviously we're all telling each other, you know, family, friends, whatever, I'm flying. <laughs> if you don't hear from me, you know, whatever. Um, but it's sort of another layer of, uh, you know, eyes on you in a way that is, uh, you know, we call it the creeper bot, but it's not for creeping. It's just for fun and community and curiosity. So anyway, it's it's such a neat thing. I don't know how, I don't know how you did it. Uh, it's prob <laughs> I'm hoping it's not illegal, but I think it's pretty great. Yeah, as uh, as Mr. One Bogey says, you can see the ground speed, which uh, makes some people jealous. Uh, that's something I added recently was um, the the ground speed and the the current altitude uh, that people are flying at. I, I don't know that kind of stuff's just fun. Uh, it's it's just a nice little glimpse of of uh, of of everybody's flying lives in there. Yeah. Well, one more quick, um, Alyssa in, in our chat, longtime friend of the show. You'll never see my name on the creeper bot. I'm telling you, she is going to have more hours than me. I have not seen anybody fly as often mm -hmm. and uh, super jealous of it, but I'm pretty sure she's going to hit a thousand hours before the end of the year. If she's, she hasn't already. She's probably in the chat here from her airplane. <laughs> exactly right. Well, she is literally the last person, uh, the last entry from the creeper bot was, was from her. And it's about an hour and a half ago. So how do you know the Alyssa creeper bot? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you know if the yeah. creeper bot's working? We'll look and see if Alyssa's is flying or not. And that'll tell you. So cool. So great. Let's yeah. uh let's let's talk about some attitudes. Yeah. What do y'all think? Uh, level attitudes? Climbing? Um, let's talk about hazardous attitudes because oh, okay. there's enough bad attitudes everywhere else in the world. We we certainly don't need to cover that here. But no, tonight we did want to kind of go through um our hazardous bid life attitudes. And we're going to use the FAA's guide, the, their um, five listed hazardous attitudes. And we're going to run through them and then kind of discuss each one. And then at the end, we might uh, hit our friend, Mr. Ballard, released a YouTube video as well about his five additional, which I, I think are, are very good. So um, for those of you who have it's been a long time since you've taken your written private pilot uh, exam. The five attitudes, hazardous attitudes, are anti-authority, don't tell me, impulsivity, do something quickly, invulnerabil invulnerability, easy for me to say, it won't happen to me, macho, I can do it, and resignation, what's the use? All right. 
So let's go through, yeah, one at a time. And um, I think we all have our own particular outlook on these. And um, so, Ben, I'm just going to interview you for here for a second. Now, Please. Um, I, whenever I have somebody I'm interviewing, I always just want to say, I want to start off with, what gives you the right? Uh, no, so <laughs> anti-authority, don't tell me. Now, and we're, I think we all tend to think, of course, we don't embody these things. Of course, I'm not that kind of person of, you know, they seem like these kind of caricatures, but I think what's interesting about these hazardous attitudes is they can just come up in little blips and little moments. It's not, you're not embodying a cartoon character persona that you're just walking through life with and you're just not that person. And I think that's a distinction that's good to make. 100%. And then the second thing I want to do is I want to fold it into wherever we can, this is the Midlife Pilot Podcast after all, perhaps some of these were maybe more uniquely prone to or affected by uniquely in midlife um, because we do have fully formed frontal lobes, but we also don't know how to use them very well anymore. So it's a, while we understand consequences, we don't really, you know, uh, our brain's no worky as good. So, uh, so Ben, Let's just start with anti-authority. Don't tell me. So I'm going to disagree with you. I think that there was, um, and, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Cheapskate of, on our Discord server because he actually proposed the original question, which one do you identify with the most? And we turned that into a show topic. Um, I, and I, I disagree in that I do see myself in some of these. But I will say this, as the youngest of four kids, me being the youngest, and the only boy in the house, I, I have obeyed every rule that's been placed before me, whether I like it or not. It, I just kind of was brought up and I have the personality, I think, that I'm not going to push against anti-authority. I'm um, the most passive aggressive. You Pardon me? You, you're, you're not going to push against authority. Yeah, that, yeah that's what right. I'm saying. Is, okay. is that, yeah. Right. I'm not pushing against authority. I'm the, I'm the most non-confrontational person I know. I see. And, and so I, I will raise an, an objection, but it will be very passively aggressive. And, <laughs> you know, so it's hard for me to identify with this one. And, and when I hear people with anti-authority, it makes me kind of sick to my stomach and I kind of want to go punch them. Um, the guy in Vegas that busted the Bravo. Oh, said, yeah. I'm already in there. I mean, I, it, it infuriated me and I had no skin in the game whatsoever. So that one's a little bit harder for me to identify with as, as being in that shoes. Now I want to turn it back to both of you. Do you, have you found yourselves in any situation within aviation and in midlife where you kind of want to push back? Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I feel like a little bit of that is is generational, kind of being in the Gen X range where you're a little suspicious of everything. And so I I naturally do have have that bias. Uh, I was uh, uh, working uh, 10 years ago and talked about going to a, a pub and coworkers like, oh, you know, yeah, we're not going to drink. It's lunchtime. It's like, oh, guess I'm drinking now, you know, because in in software, it doesn't matter. It's it's not like flying. Uh, yeah, so, it's a good crowd strike. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I I had drinks with them. They bought my drinks once. And yeah. They had a good lunch. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's like, man, I'm simply, and you know, we're talking about that before the show, even it's like, you tell me a book is banned, I'm going to read it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's just a natural instinct that I have. At the same time, I feel like a lot of us in aviation were, even if you are that, you're also a rule follower. It's hard to get into aviation if you can't at least pretend that you're a rule follower. It takes a lot to, to jump through all the hoops. So maybe it turns you into a rule follower in, in some ways. Well, it's kind of like playing jazz or something, right? Like you, you can't just start going wild and improvising until you understand the basics and know the tune and know what the constraints or the conventions really are. 
And I feel like that for a lot of us, midlife pilots, one, we are more risk averse probably than younger pilots. And two, we are, there's so many regulations and so many rules to wrap your head around anyway. It's, it takes a while to sort of feel your way around in the dark to have any kind of comfort level of just, I have a sense of all that is the framework of all these regulations. Because even even once you feel like you have a hold on it, then there's these new sort of openings, you know, um, all of a sudden now you're a plane owner. So then you've got all of the, you know, regulations and, and constraints that, you know, uh, go down that path, you know, and then how people look at ownership, maintenance, you know, there's a lot of, uh, the, I think that's an area where I have observed probably the most anti-authority in general aviation is pilot maintenance. And I'm not sure that a lot of people are working under the, I'm not sure everybody's working under the uh, supervision of a, a mechanic at all times for these things that fall outside of that criteria. But um, for me personally, I, I feel like I'm pretty, I'm pretty rule focused and I get kind of annoyed with, um, I don't know. I get annoyed when I see people cross the whole short line before completing their call that they're taking off, you know, or taking the runway, even just little things like that, um, kind of, kind of bother me. I'm pretty serious about like, about the lines as much as I understand them to be. And as much as I continue to learn, but I mean, um, I don't feel like I really am, but I would say in other ways, anti-authority, like you said, Ted, is throughout my personality. I mean, I, half of how I've even had any kind of careers or anything else is by having a sort of uh, attitude of easier to ask for forgiveness than permission kind of mentality. But airplanes and safety and it's just a different sphere. I don't really feel like I, I want to push the, the edges of. Right. Well, well I, I want to highlight, about, uh, I want to highlight uh, Cheryl in the comments and uh, she corrected the comments slightly, but um, I'll say what she meant. She said, flying is probably one of the few areas in my life that I am not anti-authority. That's it. I think that's true for a lot of us, mm -hmm. right? It, no matter what you are in life, I think at least some of us turn toward aviation. It's like, okay, this is serious. A lot more at risk. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one and we'll keep the interview format going. Ted, do you identify with impulsivity? Impulsivity, do something quickly. You know, I try not to, it, it is easy. I think that's one of the things when you're in training and you're, you're learning, oh, we're going to pretend the engine is out and you're like, I must find where to land very quickly. This We've got two seconds to figure this out. And so I think in some ways, um, a lot of aviation is about deciding what is important to do in the moment and what can wait and what you can think through rather than react to immediately. So, you know, I, I think I'm naturally a little bit impulsive. I think we all are in that way. And uh, certainly... I find myself speaking quickly on the radio or in the podcast and it's like, wait, no, why am I doing this? Slow down. And yeah. I would say that I probably identify with this one more than any of the other ones. Uh, and, and I look at it in all aspects of aviation and even outside of aviation, I'm scared to admit. I can, I'll find myself rushing through a checklist, just running my finger down there and looking at the words and not really, I'll find myself um, in, in a lot of different aspects. Um, just kind of, I, I'll look at three tasks ahead and I'll kind of want to move up to those those tasks before. And, it, and I literally will say to myself out loud, take a deep breath. Or the other one is, um, and one of the first things when I was flying with uh, my partner, my brother-in-law, um, he had just gotten the airplane. I hadn't even taken the first lesson yet. And we were doing some steep turns and some stuff. And we start, talked a little bit about emergency. He goes, you know what you do uh, when you just determine you have an emergency? Set your watch. Meaning stop what you're doing, take a deep breath, check your watch, you know, 
don't just go jump to the first thing. And and I still remember that. That was 2017 when he told me that. So, but I do, I, the reason I, I bring it up is because I find myself rushing through things pretty quickly. That's a good way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about it in that way. And I, I should remind myself on the, especially on the checklist of, hang on. What about you, Brian? Yeah. Well, I think we're all aligned in this is the one. <laughs> this is this is uh, the winner. And we just got to it right away, which is great because I like to do things quickly. Um, no, so impulsivity. You like to rush through it too. Yeah. No, I mean, well, here's the, this is what I think is interesting is that I drove my instructor crazy in training because I was the opposite of impulsive. He would have loved if I would have adopted some impulsivity. He would have loved it because I was so painfully slow and measured. And I definitely said to him on more than one occasion, I feel that you, I, I can feel that you want to go or I, I feel rushed is basically what I had to say. Looking back on it, I was being awful, you know, just uh, just so slow. But, you know, you got to be patient with that stuff, I'm sure, as an instructor and you got to see it. But I can't imagine just if, if you're an instructor all day where it's just, you know, hey, man, this guy, the only traffic is on a 10 mile final in a cub. Like, can we go, please? You know, yeah, it's that kind of insight that they, they can put together and, and I can now put together a, a lot more quickly. But in that early stage of being a little bit overwhelmed, for sure, I was painfully slow, very averse, uh, uh, very averse to rushing. And I am definitely that way. All that being said, now I feel like, if anything, this is the one for me. And I've had moments where I should have stopped myself, like checked my watch, like you said, Ben, uh, which I love that. That's, a, that's one to write down, I remember. Um, I flash back to... Sometimes the circumstances drive the impulsivity. It's not just your attitude going into it. So for instance, I was, um, when I was flying out to West Texas and I had gotten, I think I'd, where was I? Tyler, Texas or somewhere. And it was, you know, 111 degrees. It was whatever. It was so, and, and where I live is insanely hot. It was a whole other level out there. All I did was stop go into the air conditioned FBO, get some water, use the restroom, fueled up, came right back out. And I was just trying to get right back on the road uh, for another two or three hour leg. And I got in the plane and it was so hot that the iPad, even though I'd just been in the air conditioned building, basically it took as long as me putting the iPad on the mount and starting up the plane. And it, it had already overheated, you know? And instead of me saying, okay, this is a time where you, if there's ever a time where you're going to be rushing things, this is it because you don't want to be here right now. Right. Um, all that being said, I, you know, was absent maybe some of the things that I should have to, to go. Um, and I, you know, I, I was, I just, <laughs> I basically just said, and it was a lot of construction going on at the airport and it was a weird layout and there was a bunch of weird stuff going on. I, I basically just asked for a progressive taxi and, you know, to get out of there. And I was confused even about, even with the, I, I was so overwhelmed with how hot I was that my brain wasn't oh. working anymore. Yeah. And just, it was kind of a little bit of a panic in a way, you know, just, a, I've got to get, I, I have to get up in the air. I have to cool down. And, um, and when I took off, or I'm sorry, when I got to the, uh, I, he actually had taxied me to the, the whole short line of the runway, but it was confusing to see. It's hard to explain this airport. You can go look. I think it was Tyler. It was weird how they had everything set up. It was not a normal situation. I thought that I still needed to do another runway crossing before I could go and take off. It was one of those sort of wartime airports that's kind of, you know, kind of like Tullahoma is or whatever. Yeah. And this can be just disorienting if you're already prone sure. to disorientation. And, um, and I remember I said on the radio, I just said, um, you know, what would you like me to do next or something? You know, just kind of tell me where to go. And I said, you know, what would you like me to do? And he's like, well, 
you can do your run up or you can take <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, oh, you know, so it, it just led to all these things. And luckily I was fine and, and I got out of there just fine and everything cooled off just fine. But impulsivity was caused by this circumstance of uh, all of a sudden right. being in, a, in an oven. So there's things like that I find, you know, that I will be subject to that hazardous attitude. Other times it is about just, uh, we all have this. I'm just ready to go. I'm just yeah. ready to go. Uh, but my flow checks are very redundant with my checklist usage and everything. And I feel like that, that keeps me uh, pretty pretty safe. And the plane is quite simple. But uh, impulsivity, I think I think that's that's the one. And oh, oh, and by the way, Ben, one more thing. I think that what's and maybe you can speak to this with your experience level. I feel like I'm a little bit less concerned about weather than I used to be because of weather. You know, it used to be it's like oh my gosh, you know, like I was so concerned about every little. Um, it was the bar was pretty low or pretty. It was pretty easy for me to cancel a flight or something, right? Um, now I, I'm like, this is fine. I'm look, I've looked at everything. It's fine. You know, but I feel impulsive sometimes now in retrospect, because I have been in such a different mindset. Well, and, and I think that's going to play more to one of the other ones or one of the other two. And I was going to touch on that, but cool. Uh, Ted. Yeah. I wanted to pick up a couple of comments. Uh, strangely both from the same person, uh, Captain Todd, uh, gives kind of a good mantra. I don't think it was intended to be, but it's a great mantra for this, which is, this is aviation. Have some pride. Do it right. That's not a bad way to think about this when you're in there. Okay. I'm going to stop and do my run up. I'm going to do it right. You know, like I yeah. said, I, I kind of like that. And then uh, his, his next comment, he said, I'll admit this. I skipped over a wing free of ice, snow, and frost last week. Uh, uh -huh. Todd's in. And for those that are listening yeah. uh, to this six months from now, he's making that comment in the middle of the summer and Captain Todd lives in the deep south. So yes. we're going to forgive him for skipping over that aspect of the thing. Yeah. Zero um, there's another comment. Um, and it, I haven't seen this name before. So welcome, uh, Jason. Um, and he's going back to the other one. And, and I just felt like it was really important to hit on. Uh, Jason says, anti-authority is not just about the FAA rules. It is also the sharing the sky with other pilots and doing things that threaten their safety. And at non-towered airports, this is no greater example than that there. So thank yeah. you very much for putting that up there, uh, Jason. I think you're spot on with that. I think we're finding there's a lot of, a lot of ways to think through impulsivity. Yeah, yeah. Ted, why don't you lead off with the next one? Sure, so our, our next one is invulnerability. Do you give that to me because I have trouble pronouncing it? Invulnerability, yeah. Uh, it won't happen to me. It's a uh, kind of- I don't have any whiskey, so I would be able to say it otherwise, but uh, yeah. I didn't bring any whiskey with me. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, this one, I fear death. So I don't really have a problem with this one. Yeah. I'm not ready to go. I, so. I mean, I think we're in- we're in aviation, which is risky. So yeah, there is a little bit of that to begin with. Um, well, and, and I will say this though, in, in Brian, in your example with weather planning and getting to more experience levels, more hours, more time under your belt, more experience under your belt, there is a little bit of invulnerability and a little macho kind of built in because you've gone through it. Um, I am very careful of this. Uh, I do... Um, I, I, I guess just over time, you kind of learn weather patterns and, you know, you can always turn around and go back home or go turn around and go back land and wait it out or find a diversion airport. But, uh, I think this and, and Macho do kind of come into play for weather planning mm. as an experienced pilot. Well, I'd love to talk about invulnerability, but I'm not really sure it applies to me. <laughs> Cause you're going to live forever. Well, there's something I've been meaning to tell you guys. Uh, no, <laughs> um, no, it's invulnerability. I mean, I'm, you know, some of these, like I said, it's easy for all of us to sort of wa write these off and say, ah, I don't, of course I don't do that, you know, or of course I don't have that, but I'm really digging in my brain for, for moments. And I, I do think 
I think experience, and this is sort of the stuff of complacency through more experience. If you've flown, I, I have flown 500 hours now. I have had no engine failures, knocking on wood. So that becomes kind of normalized, even though I'm talking about it, I'm planning for it, I'm expecting it, I'm practicing it. There's still, you know, people say, and I do this too, I'm expecting the engine to fail on takeoff and here's what I'm going to do. And you can say it all day, but the, it's, I don't know, it's, yeah. Do I really, if I was a gambling man, would I say, really, this is going to happen? And, and so my subconscious knows that I'm heavily biased towards the likelihood of this happening is very, very, very slim. And so I suppose, you know, there's been times where maybe I've just been in cruise for a long time and I just kind of have to snap myself into the mindset of, you know, if I, and I'm very good about, I'm looking where I'm going to land all the time. I'm planning my routes to be as smart as I can, all that. But even still, there's just even little moments where I just go, have I really thought this out fully or is this really the best, you know? So it's it's not as black and white as I'm either off the charts uh, thinking this is just not going to happen to me, but maybe it's more specifically, have you forgotten that this could happen to you in this moment, if that makes any sense? Yeah. I, I would add to that. There, there are times when I, I know people who... Um, who have flown with their plane that was technically legal to fly, but I wouldn't have done it because of some damage to some equipment. Yes. And uh, once again, uh, Jason makes another comment, which this kind of plays into invulnerability has a sinister cousin that creeps up uh, when you have it. And that's, well, I have done it this way and it's been fine. Yes. And, um, I think you could also apply that to, I know some people that, uh, that will scud run. And, you know, if you're going 40 miles away and you know the terrain in inside and out and you're in class G airspace, then you know what? Uh, okay. But you might build up that mindset that, well, I can do this here. I can do this anywhere. And the next thing you know, you've clipped a guy wire and uh, you've burned a hole in the ground. So um, I, I've seen it. Uh, I think the three of us are probably of similar personality that it doesn't really come back into as much. Mm. I do. I think that we can use a bit of our midlife personalities to to help with this, which is uh, if you do some debriefing of your flights, you can think through small mistakes that you made and things like that. Uh, Scud running is a great example. I've had a couple of those where it's like, oof, you know, I wouldn't have started out doing this if I thought about it, right? And these aren't huge, right? I'm not, I'm not flying at 300 feet, you know. But, right. but ways where where you talk yourself into it, right. and that to me is the real value of of a debrief, even not a formal one, even just driving home and thinking about the flight, and writing it a, in your journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn oh. from your own flying. Yeah. yeah. Shall we move on? Yeah. The next one I do, um, I want to be careful how I position this because I want to subject myself to a lot of ridicule, which is pretty much par for the course for me. But <laughs> I have found that macho-ism can creep up on you when you've accumulated more hours. Um, it's part of that experience bag that you're filling up that we were alluding to earlier that you know, you've got to be careful. You really do have to stay within your means. Um, you know, I, I've had, I, I wouldn't say that they were close calls or things that, um, like I walked away from thinking, man, I really got away with one. It's not that at all. But, um, on the trip to St. Simons that we talked about on the last podcast, it just, you know, I weighed everything that we put in the airplane. I know that we talk about if it fits, it ships, but I am conscious of my weight and balance. And for the first time flying, as I mentioned that time, was I was getting 200, 300 feet per minute. 
in a fully loaded airplane, which wow. I'm used to 700 feet to a thousand feet per minute. And that was kind of a wake up call that it's been very macho of me to say, if it fits, it ships. Yeah. When that's really not the reality. And I need to be mindful of that it's a cute thing to say, I guess, but that's, that's, you, and it's that normalization of deviance uh, that Adam Bolra, uh, Adam V mentioned. That's, that also feeds that, that macho uh, hazardous attitude. So I didn't actually identify with impulsivity when, when Brian said that was all of ours. In a weird way, macho is the one that hits closest to home for me. And for a weird reason, which is I'm so introverted and I prefer to do things myself that it's really easy to, to talk myself into, you know, well, I can do this without a CFI. I can work on my plane and do general maintenance for the first time that I've, you know, that I've changed the oil without somebody looking over my shoulder. Those types of things come easier to me because of that, that introvert personality. Also very Gen X, self-reliance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and for me, I would say I can do it. Uh, the macho thing. I, I feel that I'm pretty good about saying just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And I'm so conditioned to the idea that we never have to fly. That is part of being a midlife pilot is you, you never really have to go anywhere and you, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, and I think that for me, if I see any example of I can do it, it might be, I don't know. I think I've worked so hard on my landings and variations on landings and power offs and <clears throat> all these kind of things that I've, I've really had to stay mindful of being able to make sure that I'm still really quick on the go around trigger. And just because I can save a landing doesn't mean that I should save a landing. And I always go back to the mentality I had when I was in training where um, I always just told myself, I don't want to be in the, I don't want to be good at saving landings. I want to be good at <laughs> landing. You know what I mean? And so how can I get to that point? And I have um, in the recent past had a couple of moments where I was happy with myself because I didn't fall prey to that in these landings that um, I was just flying back to my, uh, back here, simple little flight, the you know airport I'm most familiar with, whatever. And for whatever reason, I came in and just stuff got super squirrely. And I was so happy that I went right around, didn't even think about it didn't, you know, I could have easily saved it, but I, but I was so happy to know that trigger was still there. Came, came all the way around again, did the same thing again on the second <laughs> one. I, I haven't done two go arounds in a row. And like, I, I say, everybody get out there and do two go arounds in a row. Let yourself deal with that kind of, uh, you know, just because you can, doesn't mean you should, if it's not right, then just keep, you know, make it right. So anyway, uh, I think I'm pretty good about that one. Um, but I can see with experience that that is a challenge. And I think that's also folded into that sort of observation we were talking about uh, with the weather, Ben, and all that. I've flown in this before. Yeah. It, nothing's ever really the same. So you have right. to think about everything individually. That's right. And we'll move on to the last one. Um, and speaking of center line, uh, our friend Adam asked the question, which hazardous attitude makes me lazy about staying precisely on the center line? Huh. And I, I'm just gonna have to, I'm gonna associate that one with resignation. It's yeah. just, you don't wanna do it, then you're just not gonna do it. You're gonna be lazy about it. You don't have the Brian Siskin uh, uh, mental fortitude to have the discipline that he does, I guess. It's OCD or something, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. I mean, I'm, I'm on it, but you know, I might have half my tire off of it, which I know is unacceptable in your book. I don't know what it is. It's like once I really figured out that I can do, I actually went back and watched one of my early training videos recently and I was seeing how I was just letting myself sort of slide off, you know, mm -hmm. uh, right there at the end. And I know exactly why. And I can't believe that I felt like such a passenger in the, at that stage of training and everything. And I wasn't fixing it. So anyway, yeah, I yeah. mean, I think resignation though, I mean, it's kind of inherent in with 
as you like to say, fully developed frontal loads. We all have a um, a very strong will to live, and you know, just giving up is really not part of our makeup. Mm-hmm. We've all faced adversity to achieve our ratings, and you know, it's it's just not, we're not in in that shape. So I don't know that we need to spend a whole lot of time. Do you guys have any thoughts on it? Uh, I mean, I'd love to, but what's the use? Yeah. <laughs> What's the use? Good, good call. I, I, I would like to say, I guess, that I feel, um, as I mentioned, and I think in training, this is one that comes up a lot more than it has for me later on. And I do think that everybody can relate to the periods and points in training where you felt like a passenger and your instructor probably said, you're acting like, you know, you, there's a point where you're giving up on your authority over what the outcome is here. And yeah. in terms of the landings, especially and all that. So I think that that's for anybody listening that is early on low hours, maybe this is one to really watch out for because you have a lot, you you have total control um, available to you under most circumstances. So right. don't, don't uh, just say, ah, you know, well, I guess I'm just going to sideload this, or, you know. Yeah, I, I feel like the the common joke any landing you walk away from is a good one is kind of a form of resignation. Mm. You want to make them a little bit better than that. Very cool. Um, Ted, you, do you have it pulled, the queued up uh, from yeah. our friend Nathan B's um, five additional hazardous? Yeah. Can we run through those real quick? Yeah, Mr. Nathan Ballard. Uh, CFII. These are definitely our favorite CFII named Nathan Ballard, who's in the Discord. Uh, he did a video in January called Fresh Hazardous Attitudes You Need to Know in 2024. And you can watch the whole thing. We're not going to sit here and explain what each of these is. Uh, but just as a as a quick overview, uh, first one is Dunning-Kruger syndrome. Uh, second one is decision fatigue. Third, automation bias, relaxed discipline, and medical masking. This are, it's great to, to think about more than five uh, hazardous attitudes. I what was that, the, the fourth one? I'm sorry, I, it kind of glitched on my side. Yeah, it's relaxed discipline. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Uh, to Todd, I'm not to Todd, but uh, to Adam V, the center line is probably relaxed discipline. It is probably a more accurate uh, yeah. pick there. So we invite all listeners to yes. email us at midlifepilotpodcast at gmail.com and create your own hazardous attitude or tell us your story. And uh, we'll keep coming back to this because I think this is a great uh, thing to keep keep talking about. Yeah. And, you know, for the record, I did look through Killing Zone to see if it had any mentions of it. So it does not mention hazardous attitudes in Killing Zone. Otherwise, we would have been reading from it because... Uh, Nathan Ballard is a CFWI. Killing Zone is an authority. We are not authorities. And it's always good to hear from each other, but it's also good to know who actually knows what they're talking about. Awesome. Um, Ted, I believe we have some feedback uh, to read. Do you want to hit that tonight? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do you have that pulled up? I have it pulled up. Okay. I can read it, actually. So this is um, from, uh, this is for, this is from RK in uh, Romeo Kilo in Virginia Beach. And it's for, uh, from a previous feedback that we've gotten, it's for John R. out of Elkins, Nevada, who was thinking about a Zenith, but was afraid it was too slow. He's, we, he says, we're in the same boat, but I'm returning to flying at 70 years old. In the end, I realized that Southwest can get me anywhere in the U.S. and in, and in all weather in a day for about $500. If you add that to your buying equation, I think it helps the decision making. In the end, I went for fun and bought a bush cat. At a practical cross-country speed of about 90 miles per hour, my bush cat, I call it the swamp cat since it's based on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp near Norfolk, Virginia, has reasonable speed but its real draw is its stole-like short field performance. I'm in and out of all the local grass strips all the time. 
I hit all the small airport fly-ins and pancake breakfasts and having a blast. From all the YouTube videos I see of pilots using all the BLM and forestry service public land out your way, I can't imagine not going with the fun option. From RK in Virginia Beach. It's a great reminder that speed isn't everything. And uh, I, I love the, uh, the, the short field stuff. And it's certainly easier in a plane like that. Uh, it sounds like he's really having fun with it. Uh, uh, listeners, you can also uh, look up Bushcat Tom on YouTube. He puts out a lot of videos in his, in his Bushcat. Uh, they're, they're a fun plane. So that's awesome. I, I, I do like that. I like that. Um, I like the part about the Southwest Airlines. It's kind of, if you need yeah. to get, go far fast and be weather flexible, that is only going to cost you so much money to get these places. And that's just another tool I think to use to evaluate your mission and to not overdo it. And I think that there's a lot of people that end up with really fast planes that are great, but then they don't get to do as much flying because they don't want to do that local area kind of uh, fun stuff. And so maybe that's something to, you know, everybody's mission is different, but, yep. but, but I, I do like the idea of, of, just the heads, the having that in your head to say, part of my buying budget or energy here it can go. Part of this can go to Southwest Airlines. So then, what else do I need? You know, uh, I, I like that sort of parallel. And yeah, sounds like a fun plane to have. That's what I was supposed to do tail training in, but um, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm going to put it off to the side for a little bit, uh, bit, and uh, maybe try to try again later in the year. Very good, gentlemen. Anything else? Uh, we're coming right up on that hour mark. Uh, any Anything else for the good of the order? Eric Grizzly says you can't take a TBM to a pancake breakfast. <laughs> that I'd sounds like, like a try, a, though. That sounds like a challenge. Yes. <laughs> it does sound like a challenge. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like a, a line in an aviation-themed country song. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I... Uh, you know, uh, let's let's shout out our uh, our TBM driver, uh, Erica. Yes, uh, she could do some pancake breakfast in that. Yep, and she's uh, actually going to be speaking at Oshkosh on Saturday as well. I saw. Yeah. So uh, if you're up there, uh, I don't have the details, but you can go to her website and uh, at aerosafe.com and and check it out. So uh, we appreciate everybody listening and being part of the community. Uh, join us on Patreon. You can send us a PayPal drop or you can contact us at midlifepilotpodcast.com. Uh, next week for episode 86, we'll talk about sauna flying. Brian alluded to it earlier. The do's and the don'ts. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. Anything else, gentlemen? We're good. No, but a uh, great topic and great discussion. And thanks to everybody in the chat for uh, adding to it. It was awesome. Great to see everybody in the chat. Um, join us on Patreon so we can see you in the Discord server, everybody. Until then, it's a wrap for episode 85 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast. We look forward to hanging out with you guys all next week. Have a good one.